I remember, you know, sighing some relief, thinking, God, I've got my first TV, then it was taken away from me. Now we're going to do a second series. Wow. You do a first series, and then you wait for that great moment where you think, oh, we've got a second series. I always remember them as being quite sweaty times, you know? Uh, am I ever going to work again? The second series was commissioned before the first one went out. Um, uh, and the, the rumour has it, if the second series hadn't been commissioned before the first one went out, they, they wouldn't have recommissioned it. I think it was clear enough by the end of the transmission of the first series that we'd got something that people were really quite specially hooked into here. The viewing figures for the first show were actually very good. I think it was 5.3 million, and we were second or third on BBC Two. The expectation, really, within the BBC system at that time was if you did, you always did it in six or sevens, and if they worked, you'd come back and do more next year. And we thought, great, because now we know what we want to do. We've, we've, we've hit the seam, and we're ready. You know, you're never satisfied with anything you do anyway, so you just want everything to be better. Funnier, stories better, acting better, set better, look better sophistication better, effects more of them, just everything, just better. Right, we're up to speed, stand by. That was the lovely thing. By the end of that first series, Rob and Doug's imagination was on a roll. I remember Rob and Doug coming to Ed and me to ask if we could do an entire episode underwater. To which Ed went, and I went, no. Um, and then we tried to actually started trying to work out ways that we could do an entire episode underwater, which I think is where Backwards came from, which happened later in the next series, um, because if they couldn't do it underwater, they'd do the whole thing back to front. We didn't like that first series, and we asked the BBC not to repeat it, which I thought was you know, a key um, reason in, in ultimately the series being a success. There is a a wisdom in the business that you shouldn't actually uh, even judge a series until show 10 or 12 uh, because it hasn't, it, 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 you have to write the crap out of it before you, you find the, the meat. After weeks and weeks of editing on the first show series, you, this, the mistakes start to scream out at you, really. We moved away from the World War II submarine look. That was say, stated at the very first meeting, and I think by sort of episodes three and four. The show was growing. I was slightly obsessed at the beginning without having too much colour into the first series because we wanted to try and create the ironmongery look. But in actual fact, because it's a sitcom and there's blanket lighting and you can't get round that, it just everything just looked grey as opposed to ironmongery. The whole look of the second series just went up a notch. It all just got a little bit brighter. But we still had to use the same set we couldn't throw the set away and start again or at least we didn't think we could so we tried to just give it more life we did add color in the second one we had a little more money to spend on it then but i, I always thought it was a question of just feeding so much color in all the effect of emptiness would, would be lost somehow now we had our sort of plot scene uh, we knew we could do science fiction plots, and we 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 liked the you know exploring the individuals. Um, you, we were sort of forced into creating their backstories much more uh, realistic. <laughs> Grandma tried to explain, you know. She said, "So he'd gone away, and he wasn't coming back." So I wanted to know where, like, you know. She said he was very happy, and he'd gone to the same place as me goldfish. <laughs> so I thought they'd flushed him down the bar. <laughs> Acting-wise, I'd gone away and done a thing called The Marksman as well, which is this drama um, set in Ireland where I got to play a villain. I'd done that, and I was a little bit, little bit more comfortable in my skin. Where did you get the helmet? Or I could do it. Where did you get the helmet? Do you know what I'm saying? The concept of going outside Red Dwarf was something we didn't want to entertain initially because it opens a can of worms to do with alien landscapes and all that stuff. We didn't want it to look like it was shot in a, a quarry in Wales and be all Dr. Huey-fied. But then we did think, well, actually, planets exist. You can go onto a planet. It'll be fine. Um, so it was partly that and partly, yeah, you know, budgetarily, we reworked the show so that we could go outdoors. We had all the basic model shots of Red Dwarf in space in the can, so we had more of a budget to spend on new model shots, and we even had a location uh, budget. <laughs> That's the 
Do your box, man. I'm telling you. Blue Midget was was different, and once again, even and they were change of colour and to give people big blue washes um, from a space, but it was very small, especially the rear seat. It was quite tricky lighting people in that. I couldn't light from above, and I, I started to put lights within the set. I built it, yes. And Peter Ray came up with that marvellous Tonka toy thing that went erratically all around. It was, it was a lovely thing. It was a fun house of mine. His mind was more like a little conventional spaceship. I just can't wrap my head round it. <laughs> Removing the pixel effect was great, you know. That's what I always wanted, was to, to see me as I am, uh, you know, the deadpan, droll, cheeky, you know, all those elements so you could see the actual person. But it was, it was important not to see the neck and we, you know, we had the, uh, the double-sided tape on the polo, black polo yeah. <laughs> Donette Stefano, little Italian pocket dynamite she was. And she was, she, she was charged with a... She was our nanny, basically. She was our nanny, governess. Was four and a half foot tall, but would beat you up. I'm not bossy, I'm lovable. Really nice. If you've got a problem, come to me and I'll sort it out for you. She was really doing four people's jobs, but she had this kind of interesting relationship with the cast. We were all sort of quite keen footballers and we... So we used to bring a ball in, and at lunch break, you know, those, they're big, those rehearsal rooms in, in Acton. We'd clean all the, all the stuff, all the debris around to the sides, all the props and stuff like that, and we'd have a game of like three a side, two a side. We would scoff lunch quickly so we could get back to the rehearsal room and have a game of football. Of course, it was frowned upon, like we were banging the ball off windows. It was only a matter of time before the window broke on the fourth floor and the glass fell down. Norman, you know, his dream was to be a football player and he always said if it wasn't for the art attack I could have been a professional. We were playing and I don't know it was two all or something we we're playing for a winner so do me a favour let's play for the winner give us a break it's something stupid like that she's saying if you I'll take the ball and she took the ball away and hid and locked it in a cupboard. Lovett wouldn't go back to work until he got his ball back he, and he was he, he almost walked out you can't have my ball where's my ball isn't it? And uh, yeah, he made a big fuss about it. I was the only BBC representative on the in the studio, the rehearsal studios, about health and safety. We had metal poles that were there to represent doorways that you could hurt yourself with. If someone would have fallen over and hurt themselves, as you know, the insurance would it would have just been disastrous. I thought she, what she did was wrong, and I thought what I did was wrong as well. I reacted badly to it. I thought, but I said I'm not doing any lines until I get my ball back. He doesn't mention that the day afterwards when he told me he wasn't going to utter one more word and I had to give him the ball back, that the next day he damaged his ankle and I had to give him first aid. And luckily he wasn't uh, <laughs> one of the characters that had to walk anywhere. They're dead. <laughs> Who's dead? They are dead. They're all dead. My God. <laughs> I was only away two minutes. <laughs> Having a robot of any description, I was, I was very, very against it, just because it's a cliche in science fiction things. From the 50s, I just thought we'll steer clear of that, and it was really another obstacle we'd put in our own way, just in case anything got easy ever. And, but we, I, we, we sort of agreed it would be OK to have a robot guest star. Uh, because we were looking for guest stars and we could afford them this time and you can't have aliens, so what the hell are you going to have? We decided to cast David Ross and this was a bit of our own casting. And we wanted David because we worked with him on Wrinkles. Hello, John. Busy, are you? Yeah. I'm chopping down this tree. You haven't seen Arnold, have you? No. Haven't you? No. You haven't seen Arnold then, have you not? <laughs> no. Stand back. It's coming down. You haven't seen him then? No. Arnold? No. I have. <laughs> have you? Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you know where I saw him, Tom? No. He was up that tree. <laughs> You're supposed to be a sort of elderly inmate of this, of this uh, old people's home. I was probably only in my late 30s, early 40s at that stage, but I was playing someone who was 70 or 80, which I have done on quite a few occasions, actually. He was just supreme with audiences. 
he knew where the lefts were, he knew how to time the lines, he knew how to feed them and milk them. And whatever you wrote for David, you got twice the reaction. Just sort of really enhances your own performance, you know. Just a treat to, to have a, a real bona fide actor love, um, uh, you know, on the poop deck at playtime. A real uh, actor's lovey, a real lovey actor. He's very good at crying. I, I, I thought he was brilliant. I think they thought he was slightly eccentric when they first met him. Um, but when they saw what he was doing in front of an audience, it kind of lit up the whole show. And I think even when, when David went off, uh, wasn't involved in the rest of that series, a lot of what David brought to the show stayed with them. He was just the right character to play somebody who had spent his years and years and years dementedly looking after dead people. The mask was a collusion, I think, of um, special effects and makeup and prosthetics people. That came as a bit of a shock because I'm very, very claustrophobic and to have one of those plaster Paris casts on your head is actually a really, really scary experience. Basically what you had to do, and Robert Llewellyn had to go through it in the future, is um, they stick a straw in your mouth and pad up your nose and cover you in latex. And then you have to wait, I can, from memory, something like 20 minutes for it to set before they can take it off. And it was really frightening, actually, because I'm, you know, I had to hold someone's hand constantly. Your heart rate goes up and you're kind of constantly sort of indicating your watch, you know, how long have I to go yet? And they'd say, oh, it's OK, David, it's only another 10 minutes or another eight minutes. You're thinking, thank God, you know, as soon as we get through this, I'll be fine. We manufactured the Crichton mask as one of our phone prosthetics and it was handed over to make up on every occasion. I know that the early ones were really hard work. Because I think his was all separate plates. It was all put on separately. It wasn't just a pull-on bank robber job. It was like, you know, sort of uh, separate plates and all that that were all sort of melded together. It took eight hours to do that original makeup because it was new to the girls who were doing it. We didn't have enough time, basically, between rehearsals and the performance in front of the audience to do his makeup. So he had to be made up in the morning and then live with it all day. Because the character becomes very sort of rebellious at the end of the episode, I thought the best way to do that would be to make him very gentle and very proper in the beginning. So he kind of had a huge long journey to become this kind of rebellious character who sticks his fingers and swivel on that. Any kind of mask work, which is really what that was, it was like it's, it's wearing a mask basically, alters your whole sort of demeanour in a way because you... The best thing to do if you're doing a mask work or doing something like Crichton is to stand in front of the mirror and see how this creature moves, you know, what, exactly what his, how his head turns. That's how I devised the whole performance, was by sort of creating a sort of, not exactly an automaton, but creating someone who moved in a very specific manner which seemed to fit in with the, with the head, which was like kind of questioning. And Are you sure, sir? You know, is that OK, sir? When we actually came to cast Crichton in, the, in Series 3, we uh, we wanted David Ross, but he was busy doing something brilliant somewhere. And you know, it's quite quite weird to think this, but if if he had been available, he would have been Crichton in the later series. And originally at that time, we filmed up in Manchester on a Sunday night, so it was always clear for me as an actor working in the theatre, I was still always free to go up there and do it if I'd be doing other jobs. Now, when the next series came along, I was actually working at the Old Vic. And it was a very successful production that I was in, and it lasted for quite a long time. I think we were there for about six or seven weeks, all of which clashed with the Red Dwarf job. So I had two jobs running, six weeks each. Now, I possibly could have done, because once the play had opened, one is free in the daytime to rehearse Red Dwarf, so I could have done both. But then they changed the recording day in Manchester to a Friday night, which meant I was on stage on a Friday night. So I sadly lost the role. Crichton leaves on his little space bike uh, and this one was built totally separately from the uh, Lister bike and it was a mechanism that I made again all battery powered but it had a, a twist grip throttle and it had a little mechanism for leaning the bike over when you turned a corner. Yeah they are. <laughs> Well, it's a bit difficult to know what to say, <laughs> isn't it, Ace? One of my favourite moments, I think, from Red Dwarf is that 
skeletal moment. And I remember um, when that show went out, other people who work in the industry phoning me up and, going, and, and sending me messages going, I watched that, that was really funny. The audience reaction is immense. And I still think you can see the odd corpse going on amongst the actors. I don't know who is guilty, but um, you, you couldn't use any um, other take apart from that one where the audience go absolutely berserk. For the recording, that entire scene was covered up. It was a huge black across it because it had to be set from the top, but the audience weren't allowed to see it. There was a big thing during rehearsals that that cloth would not be dropped until the moment that David Ross walked into that set. You don't see the drape going up on camera, obviously, but you still get the impact. And if you run to record, you know, recording drape up, bang in with the line, you get the surprise and the buzz about it. Unfortunately, <laughs> we moved from one set to the other and the crew just took the cloth down. For whatever reason, the bloody drape went up and we weren't ready. And, and of course, of course, the audience went, <gasps> None of it on tape. <clears throat> I wasn't happy by it. Then I heard profanity and a slam of a door. Now, BBC Manchester, the gallery, was upstairs and there's a metal staircase comes down into the studio. I heard the slam of the door and then clang, 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 clang. And round the corner of the, of the audience block came Mr Paul Jackson, who then, Paul, standing not more than an inch from me, berated me for at least a minute at full volume in front of the audience. I had a brilliant assistant who said to me after working with me for a bit, Paul, just take your shoes off when you're sitting in the gallery because the galleries at the BBC used to be up a flight of corrugated spiral staircase. And she said to me, just take your shoes off. And I said, why? And she said, because when you lose your temper and go screaming down on the floor, you won't be able to run down the corrugated staircase with no shoes on. By the time you got your shoes on, you because I, I am like, I go up and then I, hopefully I don't do it at all now, but I did. It's a distress call from a ship called the Nova 5. They crash-landed. What I wanted to do with, with that was get the feeling of a spaceship on its side with a swinging light. Something ought to be vertical and it ought to be the light. The rest of the ship at, at an angle give that impression. I suspect it was a problem for cameras and things like that, but it gave me a lot of opportunity to introduce these colours, green corridors, and pick out the hanging baskets. The whole thing was built on a tilt, so they had to, to haul themselves up corridors and around corners. It was, yes, it was a little bit like a fun fair. But again, there was Esperanto in there. Oh, si, 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 amor, oui. In the future, everybody will speak Esperanto. <laughs> Although I couldn't actually believe that this was a real language. I, I actually doubted everyone that, oh, it's a real language. And I thought, why? You know, who needs this language? Bob and Doug just wanted to make it feel more in the future that we would all be sort of like equal, you know, all mixing together so there'd be one language that everybody spoke. But then you have to do it in English so that everybody at home here can understand you can't do it in Esperanto. So I just put a bit in the background. So, you know, off I went, got my book, dictionary, did a few phone calls. And there was a kind of like a headquarters for Esperanto in Kensington. And every time I looked at it, I thought that's a cover for a government agency or aliens. Novello, I think we, we ended up just using on the sets because it was a short word. But when you came, came to things like uh, personnel only or do not go that way, and the uh, Esperanto got longer and longer and longer. And longer so you thought, I've got no space to put it in. So now people watching it will think it's some great groovy language that we made up, but actually it was Esperanto. And if you look that up on the net, you'll find that that's a sort of universal language, which is crap. Gentlemen, welcome to Better Than Life. Now you must be hungry, and there's a restaurant just a couple of miles down the beach. A couple of miles? How are we supposed to get there? Any way you want. After all, this is Better Than Life. Better Than Life actually is one of my favourite episodes, you know, in all of the Red Dwarf series. It was a good technique to get there, which was um, Craig would open a door, and then we cut round the other side, and you see him opening the door the other side, and there's a door just in the middle of Rill Beach with a spaceship through the door. Got a big laugh, rightly so, because it was a nicely constructed and well-placed gag. The budget really was too small for what we were trying to do, and Rob and I weren't helping anything by writing things like a beach in paradise. It's there in the script, uh, they wake up on a beach in paradise, and 
you know, how, how stupid were we? we? We must have thought we were going to go to Mozambique or something, but no. Where do we go? Rill. And they lied to us, you know, oh, yeah, we're going to go to Spain for a couple of weeks. Yeah, we're going to do this and, like, yeah, we're going to do it on location. And, yeah, we'll get to Spain. Nothing personal against the Welsh, but Rill Beach ain't Barbados. Being on Rill Beach in the middle of what seemed like winter, drinking cocktails in Hawaiian shirts, those days are better forgotten. Great beaches, the tide went right out, you know. But yeah, it, it was, it was, yeah, it, it was suffering. The, everyone was suffering a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Neither are we. I think that's it, isn't it? <laughs> May in real, horizontal rain, tides coming in rather quickly. But it's raining. <laughs> it's grey. Oh, well, we can tweak it, we can tweak it. Is that going to be OK? Yeah, no, that's going to be fine. Real will be fine. Honestly, we, we will get the special lenses and we'll get, you know, gels on it. It will look really warm and great. Oh, OK. And then, of course, you show up and you think, this is real. This is real beach. It's really cold. This isn't going to work. Nobody can make that look like paradise. I'm sorry, little real tourist board. Can't be done. Head wanted a jungle in Rio and this is in front of the car park, which is full of cars. So I, as far as the eye could see the cars, and he, he wanted a jungle. And I had to raid all the, be nice to all the parks people there and uh, all the garden centres. We've got an assortment of uh, plants and shrubs and what have you. This has got to be paradise, this has. 11 in the morning and not a single German beach towel in sight. The boys were sitting on their Bermuda deck chairs wearing Bermuda shorts and shirts and freezing. And quite a lot was done, but they were having major issues because they were shivering so much and they couldn't talk because their mouths wouldn't work. The guys had to sit there pretending they were enjoying the sun and it was bitterly cold. I mean, honestly, Danny was turning blue. His teeth were chattering um, while he was saying, God, this is paradise, pass me another pina colada. And uh, they had to, in between takes, they had to come up with warm thermo blankets and wrap him up <laughs> and get cardiac resuscitators on. It was terrible. From the top, as before, we take uh, Holly out. Yeah, well, I'm going to be cool this time, baby. It's 110 degrees in the shade. We're in the Bahamas and shit. The guys were so cold and so uncomfortable. We just had to remount. In fact, at one point, I remember Ed talking about going inside to the... I don't know what it was, it was like the swimming pool garden house place and that we could remount it in there and not to worry and that would still look like a beach in paradise. It was like, what? The real sun centre is um, a swimming pool, basically, but it's a tropical swimming pool with flumes and slides and whatever. The difficulty of shooting inside the sun centre would have been that they refused to close it. So we would have shot everything with hundreds of kids running around, as you do in any swimming pool. We got a motorcycle and an E-type Jag onto the beach. Now, actually getting them onto the beach wasn't that difficult. Hiding the fact that we were putting them on a beach to the company that we'd hired them from was more difficult. I didn't realise until I'd ordered all these uh, vehicles that sand with the salt can rust. So I was thinking, please get them off the sand as quickly as possible before we get another bill to replace parts on the car. <laughs> Sorry about the gearbox, loves. <laughs> and when the car pulls away, that's me driving it. Rocket, who was the cameraman uh, on the shoot, put the camera right in probably three, four inches behind the back wheel on the first take when I floored the Jag and sprayed the lens of the camera with so much sand that um, it got everywhere. I mean, it, it scratched the lens, it got inside the, the workings of the lens. The tide is always coming in more quickly than you think it's coming in. and the E-Type did get stuck on the beach. Um, and then I think we tried to pull it out with a Land Rover. And I think that got stuck as well. So everything just happened in incredibly quickly. Everyone was a bit like, look, 
get me off this beach. This was worse than being at Dunkirk. I seem to think that the sun came out at some point in the afternoon with the with the boys' heads in the sand. Um, so maybe there was just a lot of lights, I'm not sure. At the time that we buried the cast up to their necks in sand, I couldn't think of anything I wanted to do more. The temptation to just walk away and leave them was huge. Or to actually throw things at them. Our faces have been smeared with jam and we're about to be eaten alive by killer ants. Why, Why not? Kill oh dear, you can't take him anywhere, can you? Oh, you spoil this, Rimmer. We're going to die, we're going to die, we're all going to die, and it's all my fault. And then we're going to kill the seagull. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> what we actually did, of course, was uh, get four prop guys to dig a dirty great hole, um, which originally we had planned for them to stand in. However, digging on real beach um, isn't as easy as you might think. So I think it was about three feet deep. So they're kneeling inside um, with their bums down on their heels. Because sand can stop you from breathing because it pushes onto your ribcage, they didn't fill, put them in and then fill it up. They put a board around them and then layered it with sand on top so it looked like they were actually buried. What's that? That's my foot. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tickle him. I've got badly tickle his feet, man. Is that you, Dan? Yeah. I'm sorry, mate, I didn't know it was you. I've been leaning on you all along. Oh. Can we go now? I remember m marvellous moments going, I don't think there's enough jam on Chris's face, and someone having to crawl out like it was quicksand over this piece of wood to put an extra bit of jam, and then I'd go, no, not there. They'd go, yeah, where? And then have to do it again. Is that jam running, Helen? No, Is it running? Oh, it's probably frozen in this weather anyway. God, that bloody jam, it's the smell. I don't care about it being on my face. It's the smell of it, it's the, well, the chemicals they put in it, the preservatives and the stuff. That's right. The E two. E yeah, the E numbers, it, they smell. Those letters smell. I was in the back of a lorry, sitting there in front of a camera, and I'm on a monitor uh, there, and I'm on, the monitor is buried in the sand. But I'm in the lorry, back of the lorry. The other guys are in the sand, buried in the sand. I felt really smug about that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, Norm, can you come in any later, Norm? How about speeding that line up a bit? <laughs> you could get the first act of Ben Hur in there. <laughs> I hear not what you say. <laughs> OK, get him out. Oh. It's a gravestone. To the memory of the memory of Lisa Yates. Who's Lisa Yates? You're not going to believe this, but I used to go out with a girl called Lisa Yates. Thanks for the memory was a really clever, complex plot. I mean, I thought that when, when you read that series, that was the, the episode that stood out as being the sort of flagship for the series. In actual fact, I think in reality, when you when you view the series as a whole, it doesn't necessarily do that. But on paper, that was the one. That's what I thought. <laughs> Bafta. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was a, a great idea to do uh, a who done it in in this scenario when there's only them there. Um, I think I, I'm really chuffed with that show. I think it was very clever. It's like a detective story. Do you know what I mean? It's like on picking the plot and getting to it. I think we were really sort of we we really by this time we we'd thrown off our shackles and said we're doing science fiction. You can. You can fire us if you want. Oh, yes, the observation dome. That was one of my favourites. I love that observation dome. Peter Raggs designed uh, uh, part of the uh, observation room, and I sort of built the top part in the studio. We didn't use it very much, but the observation dome sounded like a good plan at the time. We wanted somewhere you could have a different mood. Lister and Rimmer had stopped just bickering all the time, which gets very tired very quickly. And we're actually sort of getting on slightly, at least having conversations. We wanted, uh, hey, where's the pathos set, where the stuff where we can do the real drama, you know, where the, uh, the kitchen bin isn't going to collapse and the whole road wants something really solid. But then we kind of dropped the, much of the pathos in, in season three as it kind of broadened. So we didn't really go back to it, which, I don't know, maybe that was a shame.
thought of it rather nice, the way they combined the studio with the model. And it really did look as though the spaceship was in uh, space. And when they sort of climbed up, it's right at the very top. I thought it was quite moving, really. I want a triple fried egg sandwich with... With chilli sauce and chutney. You what? It's a state of the art, Sarney. It's a state of the floor I'm worried about. <laughs> These days, you know, I've got, I look on the back for the E numbers immediately, but then, I probably should have done then, but, you know, the, the chilli chutney, fried egg chilli chutney sandwich was, um, was pretty tasty, really. Uh, you'd eat anything some of those nights. What's it taste like? Bloody disgusting, that. <laughs> we'll go from that to I'm a little lad. <laughs> that was a bizarre... Uh, just explain why I did that. Maybe I could really be good Someone to watch over me I remember being rather crap at it. Um, and I, I, now I always think that, you know, Rob and Doug were sitting there saying, if only we'd thought about this, thought ahead, and got someone who had a little bit of a song and dance background, uh, these bits would have been a lot easier, a bit like later episodes. But, you see, maybe someone who was good at the old song and dance might not have had the uh that is required to be the goit that we all know Rimmer to be. I was asked to take Holly outside and I ended up building a little caterpillar tractor robot that uh, would carry a monitor and career around all over the place. And it would actually do about 20 miles an hour around the workshop. It was very fleet indeed. Uh, it could stop itself very, very quickly, but of course the monitor couldn't. Uh, so we got through a couple of monitors before we got things fined down a bit. Quite tricky because we had to sometimes shoot the TV for real. I wasn't able to wipe in because it's moving. You, you can't, you can now, but then you couldn't do a travelling wipe very easily. So we had to try and make sure that the lighting conditions were good enough so that we could see them. I left open a couple of channels so that we could get a battery-powered VHS uh, machine on and pre-record all these sequences and simply turn them on and off as required. That was my grand master plan, but unfortunately the Vision Services boys felt that this wasn't completely adequate, so the Holly robot ended up dragging a video cable out behind it so that they could pipe the signal down to the monitor. I was given the uh, extraordinary task for that this episode to find a lunar surface, remembering, of course, that it has to be somewhere drivable from Manchester. He would drive and I'd direct him, whatever. And we stayed along the coast of Wales. So on from real, we went round and we came up to this quarry. It was a reclaimed uh, garbage dump. And as, as the dawn came in, things warmed up. We could tell. When they do land reclamation, what they do is they pile up all this rubbish, they compact it down, then they burn it. Then they cover it with soil. So what you actually get is the ground glowing, which was absolutely perfect for us. Sadly, all that stuff went out in the fortnight between us seeing, us, seeing it and actually shooting it, so you never get to see that. The stench when we got there. But we'd booked it, we hadn't got any alternative, so we had to do it. I'm sure all our ailments are because of that day. Uh, I blame everything that happens to me on that day. If I get a cold, I say it was the landfill site. That was a location I thought was incredibly smelly. Um, I really like that. Um, I think it's because it, it seemed vaguely otherworldly as opposed to here you are just in this contemporary hotel and here you are on real beach. And I also remember it because it was the night that Craig's son was born, I think. My son Jack was born while we were, um, while we were in a quarry in Flint and they were saying, we'll get you, we'll get you, Craig, we'll get you there, we'll get you there, we'll get, we'll get, you, we'll get you to the hospital in North London, we've got a car on standby. He had to get away and he was panicking like crazy. I didn't know, I was just waiting, just waiting there for the line, you know, no one said to me. <sighs> Sorry, no, I was just waiting, I was just there waiting for the line, you know. And I got in the car, raced off to uh, Whittington Hospital in North London, and I arrived 20 minutes late for the birth of my son. He just got handed to me like that, so I didn't have to uh, 
you know, I mean, and there's, there are mixed feelings about that. One, I didn't have to go through all the icky business. And I got a beautiful smiling baby. But two, you kind of, you know, wish that you could have been there for, uh, you know, to, for support. What it did leave us with, though, was a real problem because we'd only shot half of what we were supposed to, um, but luckily had done all the dialogue. So what was left to do was the carrying of the gravestone um, and a couple of other bits and pieces that Craig could revoice because you couldn't really see through the um, the face masks. And in the end, I did it. Through the whole scene, Craig or Lister is wearing a plaster cast because he's broken his leg. And I had to put this plaster cast on. Well, one, it didn't really fit because he's got smaller feet than me. When it's on one leg, it's Craig. And when it's not on either leg, it's because it was too painful for me to wear and we thought we might get away with it. The floor manager, Mike Agnew, bravely stepped into the frame and, and I think he actually broke the wrong foot. Somebody tackled me about this at, the, um, at one of the conventions, Red Dwarf conventions, and I was about to apologise for it. And he went, no, 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 I know why you did it. And I said, what? I know why you switched the broken leg from one leg to the other. And I went, why? He said, because you were seeing that in a flashback. So it was a mirror. And I went, yes, that's right. Well done for noticing. And I walked away. Listen, what's a stasis leak? Oh, well, very, very basically, putting it as simply as I can for your average layman to comprehend, a stasis leak is a leak, right, in stasis, hence the name A Stasis Leak. <laughs> you don't know, do you, Hop? No, I don't. Stasis Leak was the most complicated show we've made. One of the few episodes in Red Dwarf that I really could not, at the time, get my head round. OK, ladies and gentlemen, just to confuse you right from the start, we are starting three million years into the past, OK? Before Rimmer became a hologram, OK? I remember Mike Agnew, who's production manager, at one stage was trying to explain to the audience what had happened so far. The boys go back in time to meet them, but whatever that works, I, uh, no one can ever explain it. He gave up after 23 minutes and had a nervous breakdown quietly in the corner. That was fabulous, and to confuse you even more, I got a word in my ear to say, don't forget, that is Red Dwarf time. And it wasn't, it was the past. OK, ladies and gentlemen, we're back in the sleeping quarters. This is real time Red Dwarf with real people. Is that my day? Only just. I do seem to remember everyone being up in the canteen in Manchester with Paul Jackson there, saying, why do we, we all go to stasis? Or why does he then come out? And for what reason is there someone else there? Because he's four years in the past. Therefore, when they meet, if he had a beard, that wouldn't be a problem because it was six months. He might have had to have a bit of growth. Now, we talked about all sorts of things. And um, Paul was just... The eyes were beginning to widen again. The veins were beginning to come out again. And I was thinking, no, no, no. And this was, this was the night we were going to record it. And Paul was saying, don't ask any questions now. It's too late to ask questions now. Hit your marks and say your lines. Don't ask any questions now. Yeah. What we learned, I think, fairly early on was the boys' logic was infallible. Uh, so if you ever tried to outthink them or question it or in the end, almost as a game, you'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in episode three, when you did that, they, they would always have an answer. And to be honest, the answer was so bloody boringly tedious that, you know, you'd sit in the canteen over sausages being told, yeah, but in aerodynamic physics, you'll find that. And you say, yeah. He's right. That is the death <laughs> of me. Death jam. That's the death of me. <coughs> He's right. That is definitely the decent thing to do. <laughs> it was the return, of course, of, of some of the original uh, crew. Mac uh, as Hollister, the original captain. Mac McDonald was just the most perfect casting of all Red Dwarf characters, regular or irregular. He, he is the captain of the ship. You better have a good reason for this, Rimmer, uh, Lister. Uh, blew that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't like any of the people that I was working with, which is a really bad thing for me. Uh, Ed By 
was a practical joker. He would set everybody's clothes on fire more or less every day. Paul Jackson was like a father figure to us. I did like Paul, actually. He was, we'd go to him with our problems about puberty and skin complaints. Well, Max, one of those characters, obviously because he carries this great authoritarian I'm the ship's captain, you put him in any outfit you know, that's ridiculous and it's going to be huge laughs. You know, the more serious he played it, just the funnier it was. Well, they made me wear my own chicken outfit, which I think was a cheek. They said, Mac, can you bring in your chicken suit, which I hadn't worn since I was married. I remember long, long discussions about the shade of green that the paint should be. It went back a couple of times. Chris kept hitting me in the mouth with the green paint, and although it worked comedically, I couldn't talk or breathe. Bye-bye, bye-bye. <laughs> Immediately the scene's over, of course, as floor manager, I went, are you okay? And being the gentleman he was, he said, yeah, yeah, sure, I'm fine. And I could see that it was up his nose, in his mouth, it was everywhere. And because of the pace at which we were shooting it, of course, I knew that he wasn't really perfectly okay, but just went, great, thanks, moving on. Did you order a kissogram? <laughs> <laughs> I booked this man, and when you phone the agents up, you tell them, I need somebody who's prepared to stand naked in front of everybody, yeah? And she'd go, oh, no problem, I've got a man. And this man would turn up, I'd given him tights to hide most of his flesh to make him feel more comfortable, and he wouldn't turn round, and the tap was just tip, tip, tip. You think he's supposed to be in a shower? <laughs> we had to reshoot it. So in the end, I think it was a model guy that I got who was not embarrassed at all, I tell you. We shot the glamorous hotel sequence of the Ganymede Holiday Inn in the Midland Hotel in Manchester. The scene in reception is the working reception. People were still checking in and checking out of the real hotel, and we were all staying there. So the cast were obviously chuffed to bits because they didn't have to get out of bed until they were actually required, and then they wandered down the corridor. Nice and Quiet, please. Stand by. Donna wants to do it. Donna wants to do it. She's too low. Why aren't you doing it? Well, I asked Donna. But you should be doing it. It's a comedy spray. Have a word with Ed, man. Donna doesn't do this. It's comedy. I don't want to... I really... Yeah, I'm sick of it, really, Doug. <laughs> She's going to be spraying upwards. I said to her... Tell Rob to do it. I mean, I don't want, I've, I've already com been complaining all day, you know what I mean? <laughs> I think there was actually some members of the public there as well that would think, what is this show all about? It, it must have been so bizarre for them to, to even try and work out what was going on. What are you saying, mate? I'm saying that you, got, you couldn't even get a date off this girl, guy. That's how soft you are. And, uh, okay, I couldn't. here we are, ready, everybody. <laughs> Put your glasses on. They asked us not to come back. We stayed there for uh, about, about three months, didn't we, or something? And um, they didn't take our book in the next year. Pete Ragg, the uh, visual effects designer, came to me one day, actually whilst we were on the beach at Rill, and said, in the next scene, they want a radio-controlled suitcase. So I jumped into the unit car and drove into Rill and went and found a model shop and bought a radio-controlled car. And then I went to the luggage shop and bought a suitcase. And in the back of our van, I cut a hole in the bottom of the suitcase and dismembered the radio-controlled car and fitted them together and spent a happy old hour or two practicing with my new radio-controlled suitcase on the promenade at Rill. I don't like being a watch dangling about all sideways and upside down. It was good the idea of being on a watch was, was, was great. I guess that was an easy way to transport him around, having him on a watch, just to, and that, that, was, that was a good idea. I remember I got quite excited about that. It's a watch uh, that we have put a circular wipe into and put uh, Norman as Holly into it, which meant that Craig had to hold his hand incredibly still because if you move even a fraction, and I mean just that little bit of movement that's in you naturally is too much. So we had a lighting stand, Craig's holding on to it, trying to stay as still as possible. We're saying, I'll tell you what, don't breathe. No, breathe, but breathe really easily. Then we're thinking, I'll give him a drink. 
that might calm him down. You know, no, that'll give him the shakes. Uh, and in the end, I, I think people can see that it's kind of slowed down almost to full stop. In actual fact, that was one of the first times that we had the rollback and mix where Craig was talking to himself. And we discovered that when Craig saw himself played back, he started messing about in the rehearsal and telling himself to shut up. The difficult thing to do would be when one lister leaves the room and the other one has to shut the door on him. So to get him out the door, you have to chase the wipe. And Ed was absolutely convinced that this would not be a problem. You used to be able to make the wipes move by a little paddle that would move the wipe by hand. I knew this, so I thought, well, he can just keep doing it with his hand until that wipe works. We found a stasis leak on floor 16. I'm dead now, and you're not, but if I save you, you won't die. So I won't die, and you won't be dead either, and neither will I. Getting Chris's head to sit on top of a desk was actually quite hard. The difficult bit is getting the angles right. So he's in another set, and you chroma key his head onto the desk. It's just getting the angle right so that when you look at the desk, his head appears to be looking up at the right person. He has a blue collar around his neck, and then that's laid flat onto a desk. Actually, it's quite difficult because with chroma key, the secret of it is, if you can do it, is not to see the join. Where, in other words, if they're standing on something, try to avoid seeing where their feet join the floor, because that's the area that's the most difficult to make look realistic. In hindsight, I would have lowered the camera so that the edge of the table just cut the join, but nah. Now, from this point on, things get a little bit confusing. When you're doing these things, when you sort of have to show something from the future, you take a, an educated guess and you think, is that suitably vague but suitably promising? It seemed like it was so far into the future and it sort of seemed to indicate that the story would have a happy ending and that they would get together somehow. It was a triumph of split screens, particularly at the end when so many multiple characters of the same person appeared. Loads of confusion with eye lines and like loads of like, what am I doing now? What, why am I doing that? Chris Barry has to appear as I think the fourth, fourth rimmer and there was nowhere I could get him to appear from so in the end I had him come out of a wash basin because there wasn't anywhere else he could appear. We just run out of set with the amount of people, you know, they walk through a door, they come through another door, they appeared here. So, oh, okay, come out the basin. And I'm sure at some point I said to Ed, is this going to work? Um, and he went, yes, 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 of course it work. Don't have any fear, it's going to work. And then he sort of went, ah, <laughs> that. Now, from here on in, things get a bit confusing. Rimmer, you look like Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Couldn't and you grow a beard? Everyone you couldn't grow a beard. beard. Could Which you one you you monkey? Really? I grew a beard as well. Don't 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 come on, Red to the Star. Everyone, I see you, Rimmer. All of Please, 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 please. Please, look, for goodness. Please. Thank you. Terrific. He's right, you know. Stop there. Well, it isn't really Kachansky in the final scene. Or at least it is Kachansky, it's just not Claire Grogan. If you look closely, Kachansky's actually being played by Donna Di Stefano. I believe Claire Grogan was sent home by mistake. Well, that's the official story. She wasn't sent off early. I believe that when she was asked to do that, that specific episode, she said, I can do the filming, but I can't do the studio. And then I think it was on the, the Monday, the recording day, during the lunchtime. It was, um, oh, Donna, you're the same size and same height as Kachansky. You're Kachansky. So I went into makeup. I said, what are we going to do about the fact that I'm not Claire? Oh, have you got a hat? I think she had a very wide-brimmed hat pulled low over her face, and we didn't manage to point any lights at her. So here I am, dressed up with this hat like this, still doing my jobs, putting the prop here, putting the prop there, and then coming round the back of the set with Craig. I'm just looking at him now and then, but trying to keep my face away from the camera. Project, get your shot and you're done. It's a story in the world. She can tell grandchildren about this. From now on, Red Dwarf is run by Queeg 500. Charles Organs, king of the scary people. He was the guy who looks really tough in the in the old Baby Sham adverts and says, I'd love a Baby Sham. I'll have a Baby Sham. I'll have a Baby Sham. There was a big Red Dwarf dinner. I think it was to s celebrate the, the end of the last series. And Charles Orgins, who played Quig, was kind of like a mentor of mine. And 
we ended up coming to the dinner. And it was such a, a raucous night and uh, Charles was just so funny. Rob and Doug sort of just said, look, we've just got to write an episode for this guy. <laughs> Do you mean you staged the whole thing? That's right, suckers. And the moral of the story is... Sorry, and again. Didn't quite... That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. Sorry. <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's Charles Organs as Queeg 500. <laughs> yeah, he was really good playing the vicious computer. A little bit like the drill sergeant that you would get in most American movies. And he had Rimmer doing all sorts of things. Again, stuff that you'd never in a million years um, think you'd get asked to do as an actor, you know, sort of making him, you know, run around the ship and all that kind of thing at high speed. Right, 0700. <laughs> Time for an astro <laughs> shit. <laughs> You've got to know the ship pretty well um, if you're running around it with your eyes closed. You actually have to count out the paces that you're going, you know, to, to, to take and then try and reenact it at high speed on a take. And it was, it was quite tough. Every time I go to a convention, you get asked what's your favourite episode, and that's the one. The actual initiative came from Norman banging on again, as per bloody usual, that he wanted, you know, a, a story about him. It's well written, has a great beginning, middle and end, great gags in it, and uh, it, it's fantastic. Epi I think it's a great episode, I really do. Very obviously a, a Holly episode, that, but for all of us, we had nice little contributions to make. <laughs> That was great. I love that bit. That was a really, really good bit. You know when you have good bits, good moments? That was a great moment. That was a stunt I'm really proud of, and it was like, it looks really good, and it was, like, quite complicated to film, really. But the explosions themselves were surprisingly soft and gentle, just rather spectacular. I've got a run, hit a baby trampoline, um, and, and sort of hit the same position as I was when I was standing, and then over, uh, sort of fly over this uh, over this console and you know the trick was trying to get enough spring out of the trampoline to clear what was quite a big console and not smash my shins and ankles in and when they cut it it looked really good i was really really proud of it in fact it looked so good they slow mowed it and showed you it from different angles and all that do you know what i mean <laughs> but what was great about that sequence is you have all of that and then you have a great gag at the end or is it the yellow cable <laughs> One of my favourite bits was on my showreel for a long time. In fact, it might still be. No panic, everyone. I've got it in hand. The impersonating everyone else on the ship was actually quite tough, because when you're asked to impersonate one person, that's one thing. Um, but when you're trying to mix it all in, you know, to a one performance piece, you know, some impersonations are going to be better than the others, and, you know, you're going to run out of people to do. The shuttle was late, you see. What's happening then? Do you have a cat? Well, don't just stand there looking at me. I'm going to be in very, very serious trouble. My brain's going to go all scare away for you, sir. It's going to be very difficult for me to recover, so I beg of you, please, please, please help me and I will go crazy cuckoo. It's one of those things I look back on and think, it's kind of OK, but if I'd had more time, you know, I might have possibly done a slightly better job. What's happening, dudes? <laughs> we are talking Jape of the Decade. <laughs> the ending was fantastic. I loved it, loved it, loved it. It'll, it'll always be my favourite. We didn't know how it was going to end. Um, we wrote it uh, right up until Holly loses the uh, chess match. We were in a pub called the Nobody Inn, which is where I used to live. Just either trying to come up with our idea or get so drunk it didn't matter anymore. And uh, it suddenly came to us. It suddenly the ending came, and you can't believe it now. It looks like the whole thing was, was thought out on the way through, but no, that ending was literally tacked on. And, uh, God, that was, that was a save. 
And where's the other rimmer in list, eh? <laughs> Some of you are not aliens. <laughs> I don't know, it's juxtaposing uh, male values, uh, and, but like stereotypical, it's, still, it's all very, very stereotypical, do you know what I mean? I just think it's so unspeakably simplistic. It was an interesting idea, just the way we did it, it was like written by two 12-year-old earnest schoolboys. It's weird though, because the ladette culture came since that, and uh, women have become very much like female listers in very many ways. The female opposite for Rimmer was Suzanne Batiche, who I don't think really in rehearsal kind of came out of first or second gear. She's one of these actresses that learns as she goes along. She develops a character as she goes along. With a sitcom rehearsal, you start, you want it to be funny instantly. And she was making it funny as the week went on. And by day three, I was beginning to absolutely shit myself. And we were really worried that she wasn't nailing this, like, uh, this rimmer. Um, she was just, we couldn't see it, you know what I mean? Because her performance was so minimal and so subtle. She was just studying Chris, basically, and his performance and, and becoming the mirror. Change. I don't think Suzanne was ever going to be as Rimmer-esque, you know, as Angela Bruce was going to be Lister-esque, because she was just... I mean, she was a female Lister. Lovely lady, a lot older than me, which is, um, which is quite weird, because um, cause she looks the same age. She was quite good and aggressive, you know, like you wanted her to be, because that character had to be like that. I'd have been happier if they watched some of the shows and sort of copied the mannerisms and, and tried to do that, but they came and tried to do an independent performance. It would have been more fun had they been doing a bit of mimicry and a bit of that kind of thing. Paul Jackson saw me on Friday Night Live and uh, they were looking for a, an equivalent for Norman. I'd never seen Red Dwarf before I was in it, <laughs> apart from the fact that Norman lent me the... Um, tapes of series one. I think she was a bit scared when she first met me because there was a review of her and, and in the review it called her the female Norman Lovett. And uh, she said, I'd never seen you, I'd never seen your stand up. That's just the way I am. I said, that's fine, that's fine. I said, it's great to get a mention. I just got sent the script. Well, it's got sent to an agent who wasn't actually my agent, but they still continue to claim the money for that episode. <laughs> A lot of people say, oh, how did you get those lips to look so good on normal? Well, there is a sex scene, we've got it. It's on tape, but uh, it's only available through my website. It's called Head Sex. And they said, oh, you look it like you've kissed Norman all over his face. I went, oh, yeah, well, shall I do that then? And Norman, like, recoiled back in horror. I went, oh, no, no, makeup women will do that. <laughs> yeah, OK, OK, I do have a problem in that respect, that I didn't want her to kiss them on me. I said, no, 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 I don't want her to do that. And I think she took offence to it, you know, which you would really, because you think, what's wrong with me then? You know what I mean? It's a natural thing. I just said, just paint them on. <laughs> we had a female scutter. We couldn't simply go out and make another one. Uh, but fortunately, the bodies were vac formed and we kept the vac form plug and we were able to go out and make another body shell and spray it pink and dress it with the twiddly chantilly lace around the top and you ended up with a pink scutter. We did then fabricate the baby scutters. They had no wheels, they were dragged by the lead scutter on a nylon line. <laughs> The songs Tongue Tied was, uh, we originally wrote um, not especially those lyrics, but that idea uh, on uh, Son of Cliche, the idea of a, you know, a love song where you're tongue tied and then the chorus, you can't actually say the chorus. It was, it was much more, uh, uh, it was funnier, frankly, in uh, Son of Cliche, but funkier in, uh, in Red Dwarf. Music was written by um, Howard Goodall, who'd written the, the theme music, and the uh, lyrics are by uh, Rob and Doug. Danny and Craig had this great idea that they would do a completely different version. We tr tried to make it a little bit more funky, that, you know, people would really be into it. The music Danny likes 
I would ex I would have expected to be much more kind of extraordinary uh, and kind of out there. And in fact, it's not. It's a kind of theatre music that's all right, but I don't really see that there's a massive difference between what was presented earlier, where the lyric was funny, and this one, which is, yeah, it's funky. I mean, man, if that's funky, I don't know what funky is. For the basis of the comedy itself, Howard Goodall's was, uh, was more than good enough. Uh, what you've got to realise, it's a comedy scene in a comedy. Do you know what I mean? You don't need to have, like, Luther Vandross's band playing it. I was never really happy with Tongue Tied. I never really thought it was as good as I hoped it would be. Um, mainly that's in the shooting. Um, but also, if we could have stopped, started, changed the lighting, done a lot of things that we didn't have time for. It was a big Top of the Pops type set, but it still had to look industrial. It was done on scaffolding. It filled half the studio. They decided amongst themselves the area that they'd be happy dancing in. As far as I was concerned, I think it was just a bit too large, a bit uneasy with it, a bit sparse too. We spent about 75% of our rehearsal time working on that number. It was something that was new to them, not to Danny. Danny was, this was sort of like Danny's vehicle in a way. And the guy who played Queeg, Charles Organs, was also the choreographer of it. I seem to remember Ed Bai coming in, sort of saying, have you finished with them yet? Because he wanted to get on with rehearsing there is the other 80% of the show to do, uh, the comedy, you know, remember that sitcom? No? Okay, right, tell me when to finish. Um, there's all that kind of uh, funny vibe going on between Charles and Ed at the time. You know, I'm, I'm, I won't take long. Okay, give me another, give me another five days. I tried to say I love you, love you, but it came out kind of wronger. wronger. It sounded like new. Charles is like his queer character he's a bit of a taskmaster so you know the boys were like oh he didn't want to do it but we was adamant that they did it because that's the comedy part of tongue tied i think if you look at it you can see that very rarely do they actually go down to our feet to see our incredible dancing and that's because our incredible dancing was incredibly bad and plus, if we're honest, I mean, it was all like, oh, God, it's all Danny. It's all Danny's week. It's Danny, 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 Danny. Because who were that immature, you know? Right on, sis. <laughs> See ya, ho. Nobody wanted Norman to go, including Norman, I think. I'd gone to Edinburgh, I'd met my wife, and we, I decided to live in Edinburgh with her. I'd also was doing a series in Glasgow of my I Love It. What about this, then? What about it? Dream Machine. Yeah, but it only works on you. Yeah, it does only work on me. Otherwise, I'd be a millionaire by now. I'd done two series of Don't Miss Wax, two series of Red Dwarf, and I don't know whether I saw it as a progression of saying, right, I'll do my own series now, two series of that, perhaps. So he asked to be allowed to not come to rehearsal in London. He said, look, I'm in Glasgow, Edinburgh. Uh, I've got to come all the way down to London. Then I go up to Manchester. Then I go home. Quite frankly, I only sit on a stool. You don't need me for camera rehearsals. And I just felt that that was, I suppose there's no other word than bad attitude. I mean, maybe I was too picky at the time. And the reason we wanted Norm at rehearsals is you need him around to test things on. You can't show up and do Queeg, uh, you know, the day before, um, because he doesn't give anyone a chance I mean, it just certainly doesn't give the writers a chance to see if the lines are working or give you more or, you know, when you have someone like Norman who is funny, really funny, um, you kind of get, uh, we're kind of like comedy vampires. We're able to suck um, humour out of just being around someone and seeing the way he drink a cup of tea or his intonation, the way he says the word yellow. If he's not there, you can't do that. And it's just not fair to expect the actors to go into what is a technical environment in the studio. When you get into a studio, you're not rehearsing for the actors anymore. You spend a day or a day and a half sometimes literally blocking for sound and cameras and VT and costume and so on. So if Norman had just been joining us at that point, the first time they'd have all performed the piece together would have been in front of the audience. And I thought that wasn't fair on anybody. So I said to Norman, look, I don't need you here all week, but I do need you here for a day or two days, I can't remember. And they said, yeah, yeah, OK, we can knock a day off, but we're also going to knock quite a lot of the fee off. And I said, look, well, I'm not doing it. I said, I want the same as what they said they were going to pay me in the first place. I think he thought that we would have no option because he was, he was, he was Holly. 
I think Paul Jackson was not, you know, typical producer. Yeah, I'm not putting that get out of the show, you know. I think he made a big mistake by acting like that and not really thinking about it. It could have been resolved. I think Norm regrets his decision uh, tremendously, really. And, um, and I regret his decision as well because he was a much valued member of the crew and, and a lovely bloke and a personal friend. And you, you kind of, you know, wish he'd done the whole journey with you. But then, you know, maybe if you look at the two main players in that little scenario, then, you know, it was a, a fairly two immovable beasts, really. If it was me involved now, there was no way he would have left. Uh, I would have put an arm around Paul and an arm around him and we would have gone into a room and we would have sorted it out. And also they promised me that they would uh, replace my part with a completely different character. So you never believe what they tell you because they put Hattie played the part. So they, what they tell you, you know, they just, they just lied to me, basically. Why would you go, Norman, you, you're making this crazy decision to go off, but in deference to you, we are going to leave a special sort of hallowed piece of ground uh, around the character, so we'll never come near that. Because um, thank you for leaving uh, and making this idiotic decision, but rest assured we will have someone completely different. We would never do that. I mean, what, you would, of course you wouldn't. I mean, what you would say is, Norman, you're mad, please come back. And then he goes, no, I'm not. And you go, OK, fine, well, that's really sad. Thanks, bye. And then, right, who are we going to get? I mean, I kind of felt that was my normal type of thing. I didn't really feel I did it too much like Norman. I didn't didn't go out of my way to do it like Norman. I kind of it was just how Holly was, I think. And Norman love it on the phone to me, going, "She's robbing my act. She's robbing my act, Craig. She's robbing my act, isn't it? Why couldn't she be someone else? Why couldn't you do it a different way? She's just being me, like, uh, oh Norman, it's not that. It's not my fault. It's blue for not pregnant, right? Yes. Oh, good news. Excellent news, Listy. Oh, thank God. I'm going to be an uncle. <laughs> <laughs> it was pregnant. What happens to that? <laughs> we actually started writing a script called. Dad. I think the opening couple of scenes were all pretty good. It's one of those things where it could have worked, whether we had the ability to make it work uh, at that time, probably not. Doug had recently become a father and I hadn't yet. And when you've not had children, people who are interested in children and having them and all things related, just seems like the dullest thing in the world. You have no interest whatsoever you know, it's a baby, yeah, yeah, lovely. I remember um, preparing a bottle and you have to have this powder and you pour whatever you had to pour into it. And I was preparing it for my son at the time like I was doing a major surgical operation. You know, there was not a germ within half a mile of this room. I was so scrubbed up and whatever. And of course, this is, you know, having a bottle, they have like eight bottles a day, but I was like 20 minutes. No one had ever prepared a better bottle. <laughs> and so, Doug had all this experience he could bring to the script, and I had none of it. And I just, yeah, I, was, I didn't want to know. And I was doing this, and then suddenly realizing that there's a sort of real madness that's overtaken me. And maybe, if would that be the same for Lister? Could this slob turn into, you know, hey, you know, that's not good enough? And ah, oh. we just didn't have the same communal experience that we normally drew on to write a script, and it was just, it just, we couldn't get it to work. I was just beside myself with what about the continuity problem? And Rob was very much, so what? Who cares? And it was really, I think it was in the edit, we actually, I think, oh, the very last day of shooting, came up with the idea of the, the runner where, where you explain it and then it goes too fast for you to read, but it does kind of make sense if you want to pause it, which was a coup, it was a real coup. And I felt better, but it's still like such a cop out. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is. The results of the test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's funny.